Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and I have a special guest with us today. Her name is Beth Silvers. She is the co-host with Sarah Stewart Holland of the popular podcast, Pantsuit Politics. And she's co-author of the book, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening, A Guide to Grace-Filled Political Conversations, a book where two friends on opposite sides of the aisle provide a practical guide to grace-filled political conversation while engaging readers to put relationship before policy and understanding before argument. Beth, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Doug. So I really enjoyed your book because I think <laughs> I think everybody would say we need more grace-filled political conversation, especially in 2020. We're all inside. We've all been inside for a little too long and our inner rage is just coming out and we all need a dose of, hey, how do you do this kind of, you know? And so your book really kind of fits that description in like, hey, what does it take to have good conversations with people whom you disagree with about policy and, and even a little bit of, you know, your personal philosophy of how how the world ought to be run. So let me give you a moment here to tell your personal background and how you and Sarah met and, you know, kind of leading up to the your podcast and your book. Sure. Sarah and I went to college together at Transylvania University, a small school in Lexington, Kentucky. We were in the same sorority. We were kind of we were always friendly, but not close friends. We both went off to law school, but in very different directions after college. Uh, Sarah went to D.C., ended up working in a senator's office. She worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2012 and then returned to her hometown of Paducah, Kentucky to raise her kids and started what she calls a mommy blog. I think it's a little bit more complex than that because she <laughs> would do like a stroller review and then she would share thoughts on the Syrian civil war. So she was a very complex yeah, mommy mama things, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but she did a great job of showing how women can have a, a, we can contain multitudes in that, in that young parenting space. So I started reading her blog while I was working. Um, I went into private practice in Cincinnati, Ohio, after law school and then became a human resources executive. And so I started reading Sarah's blog. And while I was on parental leave with my first daughter, uh, reconnected with her. And then again, when I was on parental leave with my second daughter, started writing for her a bit. And one of my posts, it's referenced in the book, was about how I wish we could have more nuance in social media conversations because you you post something and then it was like Cecil the Lion, right? Um, and people would just assume all these things about you. And I felt like the internet was getting really weird. And that prompted Sarah to invite me to do a podcast with her. I didn't know what a podcast was at the time. This was mm. uh, 2015. But her husband really helped us figure out how to put the show together. And we just started having the kinds of conversations we wish we could hear elsewhere, mm -hmm. where it isn't kind of a debate. And the point is not to own the other person or make anyone feel less empowered, but in fact, that we could talk and feel kind of refreshed and clear on where we stood, whether that was in the same place or in very different places and walk away knowing that our, our conversation mattered and however we chose to participate after that mattered. Yeah. So did, did you have debates early on in your friendship where you, you know, you realize, oh, this is not good for our friendship? Or did you always have sort of a good rapport with the conversation going political? Well, we really didn't talk politics in college. We we just weren't that close. And so we started talking politically through the lens of let's sit down and record these conversations. Mm, yeah. And I think because we hadn't been in the same room, even in 13 years when we started, we took a lot of care with each other and tried to develop a relationship through these conversations. And now she's one of the most important people in my life, uh, even though, especially at the beginning of the podcast, when there was a little bit different political atmosphere than we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, we disagreed pretty often about especially the role of government. That's our central breakdown. Mm -hmm. We describe it as a car. Um, when, when it comes to the role of the federal government, Sarah wants to bring the power and authority of the federal government to everything. Mm -hmm. She's the gas. And I'm the brakes saying, whoa, mm -hmm. that has unintended consequences. And we really need to talk about this. 
And then it's the reverse when it comes to private industry. I, I'm the gas and she's the brakes. And so that comes up pretty frequently in our conversations. We have a lot of agreement elsewhere. Uh, and it's just been nice to kind of work that out and get really clear on it over five years yeah. now of, of talking several times a week. Yeah. Okay. So one, one of the things we'll kind of get to is maybe some of the issues and how you work that out. But, you know, the purpose of your book I don't know if it was like on the cover or just in the introduction, is like to be part of the solution to a big problem. And I think it's kind of fair to say that even if you're really one-sided on the political spectrum now, everybody knows that there's problems in politics. And so it could be like, oh, it's the other side, or it's, oh, we just don't know how to talk to each other, or, oh, we talk too much about politics you know, we don't keep it private or whatever the problem is. Everybody's kind of dissatisfied with the state of things in a lot of ways. So what are you, what are your thoughts on like, what are some of the problems that you see in politics based on what you said when I listened to your podcast that your first election was the Bush Gore election that you were able to vote in? You and I are roughly the same age. So in our adult lifetime, <laughs> what, what have we observed? What have you observed is the problem in politics or some problems? Sorry, not the problem. I think so much of politics at every level has been left to a very small group of people to manage. I think that we have, in a lot of ways, commoditized our politics. There are tons of people who make a lot of money off of elections and campaigns. I don't begrudge them making money and making a living that way. But I worry that the rest of us have kind of delegated our responsibilities as citizens Mm. to a professional political class. And I think that's true, whether it's the handful of people who go to party meetings in your small town or when we're talking about presidential politics and how the Electoral College works and the way that elections are actually conducted Mm -hmm. and won. And so what Sarah and I really want to do is say, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to get your words 100 percent right. You don't have to read all day, every day about politics. You don't have to drown in Twitter for sure. But you have something to contribute as a citizen. And we want to help you figure out what that is. Yeah. What do you think of the phrase that people should never talk politics or religion? Well, I think that that's what's led us to this place that we're all unhappy with. And it's why I think we lack the ability to do it well, because when you watch any news show where they have just like to be 17 people sometimes on the screen, right? Oh, I know, right? Uh, It's not a conversation. One of the blights of high definition. Yes. (laughs) We can get more people on. (laughs) They can put so many people on and it's just not a conversation. You know, it's a lot of people talking past each other. And that's our example for how to do this. And I don't know about you, but in my life, our conversations about politics have started to feel more like 17 people on the screen just Mm. saying what they want to say versus really engaging with each other. And so the book to us was a way to say, how can we not do that? How can we find a new example Mm. of what these conversations can look like? Yeah. The phrase, I'm going to ask you one more opinion of this phrase, because I know everybody's talking about the election and this happens every four years where everybody who has this like passion about their side winning has to say, this is the most important election of our lifetime. What's your reaction when you hear people say that? Do you roll your eyes the way I do or like, what do you think? I am happy for people to think the election is important and I worry that we always talk in superlatives. I think that that's like the influence mm. of marketing on our culture. <laughs> We're just kind of trained to think of thing in superla- things in superlatives. And so if that is what it takes to get people motivated to participate, I am fine with it. Mm. Um, I think there have been a lot of inflection points in our country's history. And it's really hard when you're living through a period in time to, to fairly compare it to other periods. Mm-hmm. So I'll just say, I think this election is very important and people should vote yeah. in it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like I, I just gave away before I let you answer that my, my thing is to like have an eye roll. And I think part of that reaction is sort of the, there is that marketing element. There's that hyperbole, that, uh, what'd you say? Superlative element that people that people bring to it. It's like, act now. You'll never have a chance again to get this special deal kind of feel to to that phrase. And you know, I, I like your response, though, because it, it allows people to be engaged. And honestly, like your response is more graceful than mine. Mine is to roll my eyes, and that's inherently not a way to treat somebody with respect if they think something's important. So 
Yeah, your, your answer is better than mine. I'll give you that. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Well, you know, I mean, look, we just, the, the people who are coming into politics for the first time, this is the most important election for them. And the next one will be really important too, and, and on and on. And I think there are some unique factors about this election. I also just want to encourage all of us to take a longer view as often as mm-hmm. possible and to like challenge some of those assumptions. But that feels like mm-hmm. step five or something to me <laughs> of, yeah, of really yeah. bringing more people into the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say that like the whole idea of having a conversation is a really, really, really long process. And I think we all have to give each other grace as, you know, the people that I'm talking to right now in 2020 who are going to end up voting for Trump regardless. They may not vote for the character three elections from now because of our conversations, my conversations with with them, even though like people live on a on a sort of a trajectory and, you know, who they vote for isn't who they are, per se. I mean, that can be true in some ways because people vote for, you know, things that they identify with. But I guess I have hope that the conversation can take place over a longer stretch and we can change hearts over time. I don't know if I don't know what you have have thoughts about that about the like the conversation taking forever because I'm impatient. I want people to not vote for certain people like this time. Like I can't stand it that people are going to go out and vote for, you know, so and so. So, I don't know. It's like it takes patience. What do you think? I think that's exactly right. We tell people all the time this is a very long game. But that's true of every aspect of relationships. Like, I want my husband to care less about how the dishwasher is loaded, but we've been married for 13 years now and he still doesn't. And so, you know, I do see subtle changes in his behavior in other areas and he and mine. This is just how, this is what it's like yeah. to be with other people. And when we're talking about issues as important and like identity based to people as we are in politics, of course, it's going to take a long time. It's a big yeah. deal for people to vote across the aisle to change their party. We're we're asking a lot of each other. And and I think that's fine as long as we stay in it. And we don't make that the totality of the relationship, because the only way you can stand to be with someone where there's this kind of serious disagreement and you feel that human impatience, like I yeah. want people to vote a certain way in this election, too. But I have to have more surrounding that for us mm-hmm. to stay together and for me to be able to influence them and for them to keep working on me. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about the idea of healthy conflict because conflict is, I mean, our, our whole year is about conflict. I mean, and, and generally, I mean, we can make everything about 2020 in this conversation. Like, oh, today, you know, 2020, it's like all, it's really, really emphasized. But even before 2020 and long after this pandemic will be over, we're going to have conflict. So what's good about conflict and why can that be healthy? Years ago, I was in a seminar about human resources management, and they talked about how we often trade short-term comfort for long-term dysfunction. And I think that's exactly what's happened to us politically and why we do need more healthy conflict. And again, if you take that historic view, we're in a really weird kind of dormant period of time as it relates to our government. Like we used to amend the constitution now and then Mm, Um, we used to work on our government more. And I think assuming we're about the same age in our lifetimes, everything has felt kind of done. Like this is what America is and we're just going to keep going this way. And the whole fight is about whether things are close enough to what America is already. Mm. And I think healthy conflict allows us to challenge some of those assumptions to ask, is this who America should be in 2020? Does this reflect the values that we've always said we're built on? How can we get closer to that? I think that healthy conflict enables all of us to feel more confident in our relationships. It lets their resentment dial down. I feel like part of the reason we're all so mad at each other right now is there's this sense of resentment, like you don't get me, you're not trying to get me, you're not listening. Mm. You know, Sarah says this a lot, that when you start talking to someone who's never felt good about talking politics, they almost like throw up on you because they have so much they've been waiting to say for so long. Yep. And so I think we just need to to let that happen. And unfortunately, we probably need like quite a few years of letting that happen. This isn't a short term project either. Getting to build some new muscles about how we actually solve problems by bringing yeah. lots of different perspectives to the table. So you represent, at least in the dichotomy of you and Sarah, you represent the more conservative right side of things. And I, I realize that that's that's very difficult to say 
having read your book and know that like it isn't about left and right and I know you gave a little shout out to libertarians but you know there's like hey we know you exist kind of comment that was cool um <laughs> but I would love to hear so one of the things I wanted to it's it's too bad that Sarah couldn't join us cuz I like had questions for each of you like I wonder if you could share with me something that you used to like just I can't understand why a Democrat Christian would believe this or why a Christian would believe this alongside the Democrats. And now I understand better, even if I still don't agree. Yeah. So let me first say that I don't want to set any false expectations. By 2020 standards, if we were writing the book today, Mm -hmm. uh, I would not in any way characterize myself as right-leaning because I think the political spectrum has changed since we wrote Mm. the book. And I changed my party representation here in Kentucky to vote in the Democratic primaries this time. Mm -hmm. So I want to be really honest about where I am on the issues. I have always found it, and I still find it shocking, especially after the past four years, that Democrats want more government involvement in things like health care. I still struggle with that. I've come a long way on it, especially during the pandemic, understanding and, and listening to Sarah I can see more value in coordinated responses. Mm -hmm. I still struggle with the idea of something like Medicare for all. It, Mm -hmm. It just, something in my brain doesn't compute with the idea of a federal program that would that would involve insurance for every single person on the same terms across the country yeah. um, or close to the same terms across the country. But, but I get that sense of we are more connected than it feels like day by day. And there are problems, especially coming future problems that are going to require bigness to provide any meaningful response to those problems. And so, Mm. so I have evolved on those issues, even if I still, you know, like wince a little bit as we talk about them. Yeah, no, you know, I understand your, your feelings there. I mean, I don't think I will have arrived at that point, even after serious, you know, discussion with somebody like Sarah or even yourself, that the big thing that I align with what you said was like the word federal, right? And that there is a federal government that is responsible, involved, in charge of, you know, whatever it might be. And I think, and there's nothing sacred about what the founding fathers said or what they set up. Like there's a lot of specialness to it, but there's nothing sacred about it. But I don't think, I think the idea is that like the the very few things that need the big, 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 you know, collective response are reserved to the federal government. The rest of it's like you got your states, you know, at this point, 50 states. And and I think a lot of people don't see that as part of the solution. And, and that's basically getting more local. Like the federal government, we talk politics, it takes brain work in my mind. And I preach this for almost a decade. It takes brain work, even in my mind, to not separate the word politics from federal electoral politics. Like, we think that when we think about politics, unless you're literally actively involved, I think, most people just think of politics as, like, the nation's politics. Right, right. Yeah. And so I I think the the smaller answers are going to be, or the, the better, more we the people type answers are going to come from states or counties or even more local, local jurisdictions, that kind of thing. Well, I've always agreed with that too. And I've always agreed that from a perspective of faith as well, that we are called to care for the people that we can care for Mm -hmm. and that we're able to do that more effectively as close to the problem as possible instead of in a more, what I view as generic way, because we're trying to solve it in such a, in such a big format. The trouble with talking to people about doing things at the local level is that that requires a much more active, engaged citizenry. That takes a lot more people and a lot yeah. more people paying attention and a lot more people running for office. You know, we speak to student groups all the time and I always try to ask, you know, raise your hand if you've ever considered running for office in this room. And there are times when not even one hand will go up in the mm-hmm. room. And I'll say like, who's going to sit on your local water board? Who's going to be the mayor of this place? You know, who's, we, we need a lot more people yeah. to actually make local government work well enough to make a, a more compelling pitch, I think, to folks who think that the federal government is the answer. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I'm going to transition here to the uh, chapter that you have in your book about putting on a jersey. And it's a really cool metaphor because we think of, you know, the jerseys are, you know, a metaphor for wearing something that you're going to compete with. And 
most sports or two teams playing against each other. And so talk a little bit about the politics sports metaphor and why, why that metaphor is probably not the best one for us to think about. Well, there are lots of reasons. So you're right. It's, it's two dimensional in so many ways. It's Democrats versus Republicans, instead of acknowledging that there are lots of other healthy perspectives out there. Um, I moderated a debate once between a libertarian candidate and a Green Party candidate. It was the most fascinating things I've ever done. And I thought this would enrich our politics so much if more of these voices (laughs) were at the table. Um, So there's that. There's the win-lose idea when what we should be working on in politics is a win for everyone or at least some progress for everyone where all the stakes uh, feel as low as possible as we take one step forward and then another and then another. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of the high stakes, like somebody's going down and we do that not only in our elections, but on every vote. I mean, this, the discussion of federal stimulus for COVID-19 is a great example. It's like one trillion, two trillion, who's going to win? It's so silly. And so that doesn't work very well. And then I think another thing is that when we have so affixed ourselves, particularly to these two parties, the entire landscape can change and we're still having the same fights. If you talk to people about welfare, for example, and we talk about this in the book, the entire way the government administers welfare has changed significantly since the programs were built and even since like Ronald Reagan was talking about them. But people are still using the same talking points because we don't understand that stuff. We don't have any kind of civics for adults going where we can keep up with how things evolve. And so we're just really stuck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I grew up, you grew up in Kentucky, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I grew up in West Virginia and I grew up near poverty and I saw the quintessential stereotype of people living off welfare, even though they could very likely go get a job. And so I witnessed it. At the same time, statistically, that's really, really tiny. And so right. when I actually learned that that's not the real experience, I had to sort of shift my views, right? And also I had to learn that when some people talk about welfare queens, they were actually talking about black women. Right. And that was not what my experience was. I didn't have black people in my community growing up. It was a very, very small rural community. And so my mental picture was very different from others. And so when you look at data and when you sort of read, oh, oh, welfare programs work like this now? Oh, wait, that happened under a Democratic president? <laughs> you know, like, you kind of get the sense that, like, oh, my, my prior understanding of things was, was really wrong. Um, and I have to, and you have to shift that. And that's, that's very difficult work because it takes time. And it, it's like, well, you know, what's in it for me to learn all this stuff about, about welfare data? So I'm not motivated. So you just keep thinking the same thing. Well, and we are, again, I think this relates to kind of our advertising culture, but we're a, we're a society of anecdote. We love to tell our stories. And I think that's Mm. important and we need to keep doing it. I also think we need to become more well-versed, especially as we, we do increasingly bring a national approach, not just to electoral politics, but to culture. Um, The more we nationalize those discussions, the better we need to be at understanding data. And it is hard and we don't have a lot of incentives to do it. And I think that part of the rejection of that discussion from from certain wings, especially of the Republican Party, is feeling like you're devaluing my anecdote by bringing this data to the conversation. And so we've Mm. got to do a better job like holding everything together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's happening right now with the pandemic. I mean, people use the statistic 99% as if the personal stories <laughs> don't don't matter. It's like, well, you know, like I, I understand from a data perspective, we have to make certain decisions. But at the same time, there are a lot of people who have died and there are a lot, a lot of people who have been affected, even if they haven't uh, passed away. Right. And and this is such a good example because it's this blend of taking in data, especially in ways that we don't understand. I mean, none of us are well-versed typically in reading public health information, you know, outside of the professionals <laughs> who do that all the time. Right. And so we have we have data in like a really weird way to have data. We have personal experiences that are very intense, whether it's 
you know someone who has really suffered with this virus or you know someone who's really suffered economically because of their response to the virus. Mm-hmm. So we have these really intense personal stories. And then I think we have this, this third thing operating, which is just a real hesitance to embrace this level of precarity. Like, wow, I cannot believe we've been so upended by a virus. I mean, that that's a hard thing for me at, at 39 to really sit with. We, mm-hmm. This has done more damage than any kind of natural disaster that I've lived through. And it's it's hard to imagine that kind of damage coming from um, something that feels really random. It's, it's a lot of mental work. So I try to have grace for people, even though my mother spent 15 days hospitalized with COVID and is still on supplemental oxygen. Um, mm-hmm. And so I have a really intense personal story now, too. I, I try to have grace for the fact that we're asking a lot of each other here uh, to embrace some kind of yeah. shared reality. Yeah, it's it's a difficult season. I think a lot more people should join in your movement in helping helping to have better conversations were just not good. And and I people blame social media a lot because, you know, you could say a lot on Facebook, but even if you have a long paragraph, it shortens it so that people don't, you know, fill up their whole newsfeed with, you know, four paragraph items on a screen. And so it feels like you only get to say a little bit and you can't say a lot in a little bit, right? And then of course there's Twitter which is even shorter and we don't really get to have good conversations and I think Places like your podcast are evidence that there are conversations that are happening, and and maybe even this one as well. I mean, we haven't spent time disagreeing very much here, but you know, there there's a lot of conversations that can that can further happen. The left right aspect of things, um, you do talk in your book about how people are given the impression that there's really only two choices, and that there is this like fear of the word nuance. So I, I was kind of wondering if you would kind of elaborate on the word nuance, and then I. I have a little bit of pushback about what you said on it, not because I disagree, but because it's like, well, I can see where people would object to it. Yeah. So for us, nuance is not about all of us being nicer to each other and that making things work out. Um, And it's not about sort of equal time and merit to every position. That's something that we have to talk about often. (laughs) Um, Mm. Some things are not nuanced, right? There are places where we all have personal beliefs that are really fundamental to who we are and what we think about how we exist in the world. Um, And so there are places to put your flag down. We just want to say that that's not every place. And when we wrote the book, we felt like we had moved into this territory where every single topic was discussed in terms of life and death. It's kind of like your point about, is this the most important election ever? Well, the nuanced answer to that is, well, it depends on how we define important And we have to look at the stakes here versus the stakes, I don't know, around civil war time. Like there are lots of there are lots of things to discuss and there's value in asking those questions and there's value in soliciting perspectives that challenge your own, whether that causes you to change your mind or not. So we don't ever mean by nuance compromised or even civil. We get that (laughs) word thrown around Mm. a lot, Um, but we just mean that. Things are usually pretty complex and it's worth doing your homework on them and it's worth challenging yourself and that we need to do that over and over and over again so that we don't get stuck. Yeah. So so you're not saying that there are no such things as black and white issues. I mean, that would be kind of honestly silly. I think you probably do believe in some black and white answers to things, right? I believe in some black and white answers to things, but I, but I would say very few things. Yeah. And my concern is that we are treating every topic like there is a black and white. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that when I, it's funny, you and I are at the same age and we grew, I grew up and I think it sounds like you grew up in a very similar church environment with like this whole, you know, you have to take a stand and know where you are if you, you know, don't open your mind so much that everything pours in and, you know, all these cliches and stuff. And nuance I'm not afraid of the word nuance, but nuance was sort of made to sound like a lukewarm position. It's right. like, well, if you're nuanced, you're, you're wishy-washy. You're like Aaron Burr in in the movie, in, right. the movie huh? in the show Hamilton. It's like, well, you just don't know where you stand. And and I don't think that's quite the case. But at the end of the day, you know, you and I could start arguing about, let's say, universal basic income or Medicare for all. Actually, I'd probably argue with Sarah about that. But yeah, you know, we could we could argue about those things. But at the end of the day, you have to you have to vote for one or another. And so how do you see voting in this election 
And you can, you don't have to share who you're voting for. You can, I don't care. Our organization doesn't take a stand, but you know, our guests can side wherever they want to. How do you view a vote that is a black and white choice or an either a binary choice? How does that apply to, or how does that bear out when, when you have this sort of strong, hey, it's not all that complicated. It's kind of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But then you got to go to the polls and, well, you don't have to, you can stay home. But when you go to the polls, if you're a voter, you got to pick one or the other or the third or sometimes fourth. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And we we get that critique on nuance um, from different angles because there's that critique of don't be wishy-washy. There's mm-hmm. also the critique of like, well, that's a really privileged position to take. And I think there's fairness mm-hmm. in both of those critiques. And, and that's a nuanced conversation too and something to be learned from. So when I think about voting, I try to think a lot about what is the job I'm voting for. You know, I think our presidential politics are so weird in part because we have this whole campaign that gets longer and longer every cycle Mm. that is really as though we are electing our legislator in chief. That's how it's conducted. Mm -hmm. That's not the job of the president at all. Certainly there's a policy element to being the president, but it's not to write laws. So the fact that we have endless debates about the particulars of healthcare policy is really strange to me. When we're actually looking to hire someone to be the commander in chief of the military, someone who can appoint qualified people to run federal agencies and work well with those people, someone who will read briefing books, um, you know, So I try to really think about the job and I have a different set of criteria for the president versus my senator versus my Mm. representative versus Mm. my county commissioner. And that is to me where the nuance comes in. So there are people for whom I would be happy to cast a vote for them to be president when I probably wouldn't want them to be like my state senator Mm. uh, because we have a lot of policy differences, but I think in terms of character, leadership, foreign policy expertise, that ability to be America's face to the world, I would have a ton of confidence in them. So that's, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden in this election. I'm happy to share that. Um, And it is because I am really thinking through what is the job and who do I believe can do it best. So that would, okay, then you're just, I I actually knew that because I listened to one of your most recent podcasts and I don't personally have a problem with you voting for Joe Biden. I'm not going to vote for him. But the casting of a vote, I have friends who acknowledge that Trump has been kind of a disaster. and But they just can't vote for somebody who thinks it's okay for a woman to have an abortion. Like, that's just, it's, it's that one, it's not like that's the only issue they care about. But it just, they can't stomach the fact of checking a box or whatever you do at your poll that says, I want you to be president And I'm okay with the fact that you're okay with women having abortions. Yeah, I think that this is I would love to hear your perspective on that because (laughs) obviously you're you're pro-life. I'm hearing from, you know, basically what what I know of you. And the vote itself is different for you. It's not necessarily what I just described. So I would love to hear your response. Well, here's how I describe myself, because I think when we talk about abortion, we're talking about a million different things and putting them under one umbrella. So I consider myself personally pro-life and politically pro-choice. I don't want people to have abortions. Um, I think that there are serious ethical concerns around abortion care. And also, I don't think that that's a decision that the government ought to make, because, again, I believe in a pretty limited federal government. And so that's a distinction that I make when I talk with people about this. And I often encounter people kind of going, oh, well, maybe we are talking about a couple of different things here. Let's go through those individually. Yeah, right. um, and I, you know, the time that Sarah and I have spent traveling around the country talking to people, I think this is the most divisive issue of our time. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. And we could spend multiple podcasts on why this issue has become the flashpoint that it has. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Again, I go back to what is the role of the president? And I think that one, I hope, compelling argument uh, in this election is that the federal judiciary has been remade. And if you are voting for a president because you want that president to appoint justices to the Supreme Court that you think are likely to overturn Roe versus Wade, I think you kind of got what you what you came in for. And I wonder what matters next on the list. 
Mm. So, so that's one question that I have for folks. And then another question is just how do, how do we prioritize this when we think about what a president is going to encounter during his term? I love to think about George W. Bush and how he wanted to be a domestic policy president. He came in with all these ideas about immigration. He, he wanted to do uh, No Child Left Behind and school stuff. And he got some of that domestic agenda done, but he didn't get to pick 9-11. And Uh so I struggle with single issue voting around the presidency because we have no idea what the next four years are going to put in front of our president. Yeah, You know, did I hear you just sort of say that, like, if you're happy with the way you got the Trump Supreme Court justices, you're free to vote elsewhere now? I think that's a reasonable place to be. I had never thought of it that way. It's like, hey, you got what you paid for. <laughs> I mean, you did. Like, you... That is what, I mean, because they can't affect abortion anything other than the vague hope that that will be overturned. Right. right? Like in terms of the president. Right. So that, that's that's really interesting. I'd never thought of it in that way. And just for those listening who don't realize this, that we have a um, LCI roundtable YouTube video page or playlist, I guess, on our YouTube channel that where we actually took like 50 minutes and Carrie Baldwin went over and discussed all of the Supreme Court justices dealing with abortion related Supreme Court cases. They were overwhelmingly appointed by Republicans. So this is a very, very blind faith that first, if you just vote for the Republican who will, if the chance that three judges die in four years will elect some or will appoint somebody that will then get passed. Like it's it's just this vague hope, right? And so even that in of itself is kind of a, you know, faint, I should say. But yeah, I, it's funny, Beth. I really like I really like that idea. It's like, okay, let's start thinking about something else now. You got what you you got what you voted for. Well, I mean, I agree. Like the Supreme Court historically has pulled people to the center. Once you get on that court, you see the impact of your decisions, you see the decisions coming before you and how they're coming. Most people pull toward the center. So liberals get disappointed in their liberal justices. Conservatives get disappointed by their conservative justices. What it means to be judicially conservative and socially conservative are different things, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot wrapped up in this debate. But it gets pushed out in that really simplified way. You're pro-life, then you are expected to vote for a president who will appoint justices that he believes will be pro-life. And you've got a conservative majority cemented on the court. You've got federal benches all over. the. I mean, he has appointed and confirmed so many very young people to lifetime seats across the judiciary that I, I really would like to know what the second issue is. Yeah, well, that's that's a really good, good question. So one one last thing is near the end of your book, you talked about how you and Sarah decided that you're not going to call America divided. I, I recently watched a show that takes place in the UK and they were like, how many countries are in this country? Because he's like kind of oblivious to what's going on. And they're like, there's four. Oh, it's kind of like America right now. <laughs> it, was the, <laughs> it was the thought. It's like, oh, that's really funny. And then and then I read <laughs> I read your book saying, we, we don't want to call America divided. So elaborate a bit on that. Well, I think that what we really want to say, and, and we would say it differently now than we did when we wrote the book for sure. But what do we really want to say is like, this is all a choice. It is not natural law that we are going to be blue and red states. I mm-hmm. really struggle with election coverage in that way. I wish we talked about every state as a toss-up. It infuriates me to read about congressional races and to realize that of 435 people sitting in the House, we have 90 seats that are considered at all competitive. And of those 90 seats, only like 20-something that are in a real toss-up category. That is mm-hmm. so disempowering. Of course, people feel like their vote doesn't matter when that's mm-hmm. how we discuss this. And when we talk about all of that as though it's unchangeable, we can change anything we want to. We'd have a constitutional convention tomorrow and really upend things here. That's the beauty and the responsibility of our system. And we just want to stop sending this message that it is forever to be a battle to the death between Democrats and Republicans. Because again, nobody likes that. It's not working for us. Yeah. Well, I would personally like to see a little more libertarians get in there and and not only like just like on the debate stage or whatever, but like be part of the the conversation. And then that happens slowly. So, yeah, well. um, And I think that's, can I say one thing about that? Yeah, 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 sure. To me, that is about structural change. That's exactly the kind of work that we want to see happen. Like, I think the Libertarian Party 
will become a real player when we have ranked choice voting. So process yeah. reforms to me are essential. Again, if you don't like what's happening, there's a place to get involved to try to change it. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. that's going to be like a much less uh, flashy position than being pro-life or pro-choice, right? But those are the places where we can really make a difference. Yep, you're right. Well, Beth, I really appreciate you coming on. There's like three more hours worth of content I'd love to chat with you about. But uh, such as podcast timing is, we're going to have to wrap it up. But I really appreciate you being on. Tell us about the name of your podcast, how frequent it is, because I know our listeners would love to listen to more podcasts. So go ahead and just end with that. Thank you so much for having me. The podcast is Pantsuit Politics. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Our website is pantsuitpoliticsshow.com. We produce new episodes on Tuesdays and Fridays. And the book is I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening, A Guide to Grace-Filled Political Conversations. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, Beth. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hey, podcast listeners. Since you like listening to audio content, we wanted to let you know about a new audiobook titled Called to Freedom, Why You Can Be Christian and Libertarian. It's read by me, Jacqueline Isaacs, one of the contributing authors of the book, and every download helps to support the Libertarian Christian Institute. To learn more and to download the audiobook today, go to calltofreedombook.com.